depth there is to the basket, the more water you can get in there, which makes your life easier, especially after a summer like last year. So traditional basket, moss filled, three chains, any more than 14 inches, it wants to have a fourth chain on it. Um, they get heavy when they're deep, so more chains the merrier. So we use Welsh moss to build the basket with. Um, well, Glenn will tell you that Welsh is better. I can't really disagree with him when it comes to moss. Um, it's long stranded um, and you can make it go quite far. You know, don't use the moss out of your lawn. There's all sorts of weird and wonderful things going to be in there. Leather jackets, scarab fly larvae, all the nasties that you don't want to introduce into your basket. So um, it's definitely a man thing. They look to save a few quid where they can. Um, and using the moss out of the lawn when they're scarified it isn't really the best way forward. So you'll see I'm just thinning the moss out and putting a little nest, if you like, in the bottom of the basket. To give you a guide, the girls at the nursery uh, and lads have got about five to six minutes to build a basket. So this is me dragging it out a little bit. So we do go a bit quicker than this at the nursery. So a decent layer of moss in the bottom um, just brings you up to the first layer of wires where we're going to put the plants in. A little bit above with your moss because it will shrink down slightly. Okay, and then the most important thing that there's again, like I said, no smoke and mirrors, there's no fandangled um, bits of kit that you need to make your baskets last longer. Just a few little tips along the way. So, we use a plastic cylinder that goes in the bottom of the basket, and that'll get you out of trouble when you're a, bit, a bit, little bit lax with your watering in the summer. And we also use these these days, which is just a little polystyrene um, bowl. Um, two pound for 20 of them, and that will actually, if you sit it right in the bottom of the basket, just gain you an extra, probably few hours after a sum summer we had last year. So you can either use both, one or the other. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just use the normal black uh, mat. So no compost, that's the biggest mistake everyone makes, to start piling the compost in and you can't move. So we'll start off with the plants. Anyone know what that is? The Peter? Everyone calls it ivy, isn't ivy, it's not hardy. Um, anyone ever got it to flower? Yeah. yeah? Well, if you got it to flower, that's not the best way to get the Peter into flower is neglect. So well done. Um, um, it is a tough thing to get into flower, um, and if you manage to get it to root into your patio and then the following year you've got it got flowers on it, that's because it's like a lot of plants will always flower up when they're in stress. So, um, the way we build the baskets is from the inside out. Everyone seems to go back to front, but we go from the inside out to protect the root ball, that's the most important thing. The leaves will always grow back. So it's your thumb and your index finger into the basket, and you just pull it through quickly, okay? Don't hang around. You know, we haven't got all day apart from anything, because you know, time is money, but at the same time, the quicker the plant goes through, the less chance you've got of anything snapping on it. So. We're going to put two plants in directly opposite each other because that's a really simple way of getting a symmetrical basket. Okay? So there's in the Peter, that'll give you your length. The plants that we're using for the very bottom of the basket have got quite a flat habit to them. So that's another one, anyone know that, that plant? Bacopa, yeah? So that's the original one from probably 50, 60 years ago, if not longer. Uh, with a little white flower. They have bred more colours into it, so I don't know whether the camera can pick that up, so this is the new blue one. Um, larger flowers, you'll notice, and when they first started breeding Bacopa for colour, they used to get the great colours, but they couldn't get the volume of flowers. And this is what you often find with plants. They get all these fantastic colours, but something has to give somewhere, and it's normally flower volume, flower size, or normally pest and disease resistance. So uh, everything comes at a price, but they've all got this nice flat habit. This is another one, slightly more rare, which is called Mechadonia. It's a yellow Bacopa, if you like. A lot of people call it yellow, yellow Bacopa. But they've got a lovely flat habit, and that's what we use in the bottom of the basket. It'll hug the bottom of the basket um, and just give a decent backdrop to whatever we're gonna put in with it. So we're gonna create a, a, a crossroads in the bottom of the basket by just putting them in like a, um, opposite each other 
quicker game. These are the easy ones. As we work at the basket, it gets a little bit more tricky. Uh, we'll get another Macedonia in there. Now, anyone know what the most popular plant people are using hanging baskets is? Close. Um, it's Lobelia. Okay, that's the one plant everyone uses. It's a very, very big seller from the 60s, but it's becoming less and less popular because it's tougher uh, to keep alive when we have hard, hard, dry summers. Uh, we use it as a bit of a filler. It'll fill your basket nice and quick, but we'll only use it in the bottom of the basket. Um, it's cheap, but it's cheap for a reason, you know? So it's a bit of a one-trick pony. Um, but it will fill your basket early doors, and if you want, you can cut it out a bit later on um, as the other plants become more established. So we use four little plugs that go in between those um, in between those main plants. So it's pretty quick, and you can see quite easily. Let's tilt it slightly towards you. So it's just root balls, no compost, nothing. That's it. Still no compost, okay? Next layer of moss. Everyone with me? Okay, so the moss is the hardest thing that I struggle to get my staff to be able to handle because it's what locks the plants into place um, and it's a blooming expensive item these days. Um, you need a license to be able to pull it unless you get in and it goes up there and I think you can just <laughs> blag, blag your way in and uh, Fill the car up. That's one reason why I've got a kayak. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're not pushing it in very hard. It's only a retainer to stop the compost from falling out. Okay, you don't have to waste a lot of moss um, putting density of moss in. You want density of compost in because that's what does the work. The compost holds the food, it holds the water, and that's what you're going to be reliant on uh, a bit later on. So. That's your basket so far, no compost, but now it's time to do the important stuff. So compost wise, again, you get what you pay for. Um, we tend to use multi-purpose with John Innes. So John Innes is a brand name for essentially screen topsoil, and that helps give some density to the fluffy peat-based compost. Um, there are some organic and peat-free compost out there Commercially, they haven't really ticked all the boxes that Pete does. Now, that's a bit controversial, and Glyn might disagree with me, uh, but certainly on the bedding side of things, we haven't got a completely peat free compost that does everything um, that we need it to do yet. But it's coming, they're working on it. Well, what you're doing, Steve, is using peat reduced compost, yeah. which you know aren't as bad as the old fashioned ones, which were. You know, heavy on the peat. Yeah, they were. Yeah. And they've also um, started to introduce quite a lot of things into the compost now to try and reduce the price. Uh, so, um, recycled carpet, you name it, they stick anything in it now to get the price down. So, and this is how the big, the big boys get, get the price down of the compost. So, the more open and fibrous it is, the quicker it will release the water which is fine when you're growing in the winter, and you can get away with the cheaper compost then because you need the drainage. But in the summer, you need something to, to hold, the, uh, hold the moisture. So we're just using the straight multi-purpose with John Innes, and it'll be just a couple of scoops um, to start with because we've got a load of root balls going in. Okay, hand under the basket always because if you've got a dodgy chain, we do a lot of refills at the nursery, this is the time when you find out how dodgy it is because it enters everything else out onto the floor. So not too much pressure, but just to tidy it up. Right, what's next? Anyone know? No, no more moss. We're all right for moss for a minute. Water. Bit louder, I can't hear you. Don't know? Right, so it's water. It's looking after the water. So we use a capillary mat in these days. You can use a product called Swell Gel. Anyone heard of that? Okay, what's the biggest downfall with swell gel? It's not re-wettable. Okay, once swell gel has dried out, you can't re-wet it. So commercially, forget it for us. 
So we use things that act like a sponge. So capillary matting is one of them. And with the mats, you can build the layers up with the basket. So if you've got a big basket, you can have two or three layers of matting. And the roots will always find their way to the, to the water. So we put that right in the heart of the basket, if we can, before we get too many more root balls in there. Okay, and we'll just hold that in place with a little bit of compost. So now to the fun, more fun parts, because these are the slightly more heavy, heavier flowery plants. Um, I'll use an old one first. Now this doesn't really flower, it will flower if you're really rubbish at looking after it, but we grow it for its foliage, and that's helichrysum. Um, the other reason we use helichrysum on the nursery is aphids are attracted to helichrysum, so we use it as a measuring stick around the nursery for when we've got any problems. So that can be incredibly useful. It's not so much used now because there's a lot more flowering plants, but certainly it's useful in foliage plants and people that want a more contemporary look, because silvers, blues, whites tend to look a bit more um, modern. Uh, same rules, um, pop it out, index finger, but we're going directly over the top of the lobelia. Your main two plants there and there, um, we'll do the trailing down. Your lobelia will always find its way into the gaps. So pretend it's not there essentially. And we'll stick in the plant straight through nice and quickly. Another one, anyone know what that is? A little yellow flower. Biddens. Biddens have been around a long, long time. Used to be very, very volatile, biddens did, but they've bred it to be manageable now. Uh, we used to stick one plug in the top of a basket when I first started growing and it would be here probably within a month. So it became a little bit too vigorous but now they've bred it to be a lot more controllable and it flowers really well. Um, so we'll use it on the opposite side. There's a whole range of plants. I mean we do probably six or seven hundred different plants that could go into baskets these days. So the biggest selling one is this one here, uh, the side of your basket, anyone know what that is? <coughs> million Bells. I thought Million Bells was a great name, but for some reason, um, these people that come up with names have now decided that it's going to be called Calabracoa. Because that rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, however, it's available in a lot of different colours, probably 40 or 50 colours, and they've bred flowers to be larger, uh, denser, all sorts of fantastic colours in Million Bells. Uh, so you can still use the name Million Bells, we'll know what you're talking about. Not many people remember Calabricoa. Um, so, again, mixed basket, same rules. So we're going directly over the top of the lobelia. You haven't even got to think where you're putting them because the lobelia has already marked the territory, straight over the top of it. Okay, and on the other side, we're using another one. It's not quite in flower yet. Uh, this is a river swan daisy, brushcum. Very, very popular plant, been around forever and a day, and um, nothing ever goes wrong with it. You know, this is the things that make these older plants better. They're tough. Um, the breathing hasn't um, changed the plant. So, again, straight at the top of the beer. Now, if we're running out of time for baskets and people are getting later and later and later to order them, um, we will then stick a few busy lizards in just to fill the gaps. Um, we have them as little plugs and we just pop them in the gap over the top of the bottom plant. So, very, very, very simple way. Everything's symmetrical. And again, we've got that same cross of plants, um, four main plants and four fillers. If you're doing it in April or early May, you don't really need to use the fillers. Um, but we've got them there, so we tend to use them. Right, so, moss up to the top now, and this is the biggest mistake people make, um, is they don't, they go up to the wire, not past the wire. Now, the top edge of the basket takes all the abuse from the sun and the wind, um, and so your, sh your moss will shrink, always. So you've got to overcompensate for that, plus the fact that that is the edge that the plants are going to be leaning on when they trail over the side. So if you've got a bit of spare moss, it's not going to be any good to you in the shed. So you may as well stick it on around the top edge of the basket. And again, we're just locking those plants in. Um, always easy to do when the basket's hanging and you can just spin it. Um, you've got a bit more control. So once I've run around the top of the moss, 
Um, does anyone know what the next bit is? Soil? No? Well, these days, um, it's feed. Because you can make your life very easy for the majority of the season by using slow release feeds, something that never really came about until the sort of the early 90s. Um, but these days, slow release feeds are the difference between a good bad basket and a great basket. Um, the one thing that has changed is the, the style of feeds. Um, for a long, long time, we had a feed called Osmoco, which is a little, if you can see that, it's like a little um, pellet that basically expands and releases the feed gradually. The problem with that, from a commercial side, is once that's in there, it's releasing the feed in the compost. Um, and if you don't use the compost straight away, it's still releasing the feed. Okay? And when I was a, a, a lot younger grower and a little bit more, um, I didn't think about things properly, I, I grew 25,000 packs of bedding with some compost that I'd had uh, over winter. But the Osmocote was already in it. So I then had 25,000 packs of bedding that died because the nitrogen burnt the roots off everything that I put into it. <coughs> took me a while to realise, and then it took me even longer to admit that it was my fault. <laughs> um, but the Osmico goes into the heart of the basket. The big change in the industry has been that buzzword at the moment, organic. Okay, And the one thing organic feeds will do that um, your normal chemical feeds won't is they'll actually build up the immune system to the plant as well. And the other thing that's quite important, again, especially for men, because they've got a habit of giving things a treat, normally because they've forgotten to do it the previous week, uh, is you cannot overdose with an organic feed. Okay? There's all the things that the, uh, the normal feeds do. So your miracle Grow and your Phosphogens that are high in nitrogen and high in potash. Nitrogen for your foliage potash for your flowers. This does the same, but it's got different active ingredients. So it's basically got things that you've already heard of before, I'm sure. So chicken poo, which that is your nitrogen, so that gives you green leaves, um, and seaweed, which will help with your flowering. So that's the main thing. It also got a few other things in there, like molasses, which is a, uh, a waste item from sugar production. Um, which glues it all together and makes it slow release. So that's the only feed we use on the nursery now, and we use it for everything. It doesn't matter whether it's a shrub, a perennial, or a bedding plant, or a hanging basket. We only use um, this product, which is called black caviar. And you'll see there's pallets of it at the nursery. We, we use it for everything. Um, so your feed goes into the heart of the basket, and you can always add a bit more right at the end if you want. But like I said when me and Glenn were talking, Overfeeding is a bad thing to do. You could always add more. You can't generally take it out once it's in. Um, so we we'll build the compost up now. This is the bit where you can get stuck in and fill the basket up. Um, slightly overfill it initially because it will sink down and we want a slightly dome shape to the top of the basket. And then we get to the plants that I call the money makers, certainly for the nursery trade they are, because they're the ones that you'll all be the most familiar with. Um, they're the top selling plants um, that really will be the ones you remember your basket for um, at the end of the summer. So we'll, st we'll start with the top selling plants in the world in the bedding industry. What type of petunia? Do you know the brand name? Safina. Okay, there's a lot of petunias out there. Safina, from May onwards, worldwide, 70 million a week. Okay? Um, there is a, a company that has a thing called Plant, Plant Breeders' Rights, which gi gives us permission to take cuttings off them. We're not allowed to do it without a license. Okay? And the guy that gives that permission to us gets seven pence for every cutting we take. Lucky man. Okay. How long did those breeders' rights last for? Is that for uh, So it gets renewed every three years, and they have to pay for that. A bit like a patient on a um, on a design of any other type, um, and 
with most things, they would be null and void after three years because a similar product would have come out without breeders' rights. Um, but Safina is such a massive brand. There are more coming out, and Safina's downfall sometimes is it's too vigorous. You know, it will take over your basket. So there's a few varieties of Petunia that we use that are less vigorous, um, but have got just the same amount of flower power. Um, so, yeah, it will stay with Safina. Safina will stay with plant breeders' rights forever the day, I would imagine. Um, That's a damn good pension then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a nice pension. They they do have twenty odd colours in it now, but it's been done to death with with the range of colours. And you know, when there's eleven shades of pink, you start thinking it's getting a little bit crazy. So uh, we pull it back to the the strongest plants. Really, um, it's not all about flower colour. But Safina is definitely a biggie. Uh, the other one that's taken the world by storm is this baby here. Now, uh, anyone know what that is? Nope. So, trailer begonia, somebody said it. So, when Busy Lucy's had all the problem with mildew, all those, well, it seemed like a long time ago to me now, but it's probably three or four years ago, maybe five, um, <coughs> the whole world pointed in the direction of another plant that would tickle the boxes, um, but not have the problem with disease. And begonia was it. And I always say to people, once you've had a begonia, you never go back, because they're very, very easy to, to care for. They're a bit of a swine for us, early season. Uh, it takes a long time to, uh, to get them going. They need a lot of heat. So when you lot are curled up inside um, in January and February um, in the warm, we're trying to keep these little babies from keeling over, and they've basically got heated benches, an air temperature of 70 degrees, um, and we have to be very hot on the uh, fungicides with them because they're prone to rotting off. But once you get them going, they're brilliant and almost bulletproof. Um, range of about a dozen colours and they are very, very forgiving. That doesn't mean you don't have to water them. Okay? <laughs> People get mixed up between forgiving and getting away with murder. Um, and then the other one that will take it very, very dry is trailing geraniums, okay? So this is the single uh, French type, which is a Decora type or uh, Mini Cascade. Rule of thumb, single flowers will give you triple the volume of flowers than a double or semi-double, okay? But some of the semi-doubles and doubles, one like this, are quite exquisite. They've got an absolutely fantastic flower, but you will get less flowers, okay, as a generalisation. Okay, um, so, and then somewhere on here, the one that everyone thinks looks like that is a fuchsia, okay? Not in flower, because they're not really supposed to be yet, okay? Um, and a pointless exercise being in flower for me at this time of year, and you'll find out why in the next few minutes. Okay, so, top layer goes directly above the bottom layer, okay? So we've got a bottom, middle, and a top. So bottom layer was your flat growing plants that are going to give you some length, and we're going directly over the top of them. Okay, in any order, doesn't matter, it's not rocket science, plants make their own way. We set them back slightly further into the basket so they've got a bit of a cushion to go off. I'm not putting a lot of pressure on these at all. We've got a slight difference in sizes of plants as well. Um, that's a deliberate move because it's a bit like producing a Sunday roast or hanging basket. You've got a lot of different products that have all got to be ready at the same time. Okay, but you're in charge. You dictate to the plant what it's going to do. So there's the missing, the missing products. I think I'll use this one. And then in the centre of the basket, we've just used a normal trailing uh, upright geranium to give you a bit of height in the centre. So not a lot of pressure. Just tick sitting in there. Okay, and right in the middle is your upright drain. But we're not finished yet. Okay, so we've now got two weeks before the customer has the basket. Does anybody know what my biggest enemy is on the nursery? <coughs> Apart from staff. <laughs> No, not, well, not quite. Some days. Pardon? No, my biggest enemy on the nursery is flowers. 
okay? Flowers equal maintenance, okay? And flowers take away strength from the plant, okay? Plants are put on this planet to reproduce, and generally, to get them to reproduce, they need to cut to seed, and to get them to seed, they've got a flower. So it's this never-ending circle, okay? And the problem with that is when it drops, it drops onto a product underneath for me, okay? Which will then rot it, because these are hanging in the greenhouse. So we have to do a few things to make changes to the basket to make it the shape we want it to be, and to make it a full basket, okay? So that begonia there, for instance, has got one, one main stem, which we call the leader, okay? Now, that'll only get, give us one set of flowers, and we want five or six sets of flowers. So the best way to do that is to stop it in its tracks, and that's what we're gonna do with all the plants in the basket, because we've got two weeks for it to, um, to grow and, and bulk out. Okay, so the last job we do with the basket is quite quick. Um, it normally evokes a few uh, reactions from you guys, but it's short-term loss for long-term gain. Okay, so out come the flowers. Okay, and this is all the buds that we can get our hands on. And if there's any leaders that are growing quite long, like that fuchsia there, we will just nip it back. Because we're trying to force the fuchsia to grow the way we want it to grow, okay? So, begonia tips out, flowers out, tips out, flowers out, tips out, flowers out, okay? It's not a child, it's a plant. <laughs> okay? So, that's the top, remove all the flowers, okay? And then round the sides is very quick. So, busy lizards, people are scared to touch busy lizards because they're tuberous, they're soft. Okay, that doesn't mean you don't touch them. We have interference or something here, I don't know what it is. Um, so, pair of scissors, quick. Brash comes quite easy. Grab it by the scruff of the neck, wallop. Okay, same with all the side plants. All you're trying to do is stop them in their tracks. I don't want any flowers, they're a pain. Okay, so that stripped it back. Biddens hasn't got any flowers on it. But we're just going to take the leaders out, like so. And Lobelia is the most invasive plant we've got in there. It's very quick off the mark. Okay, so we just knock that back as well. Okay, so all the colour is gone. But these things are made to flower. They won't keel over. They'll stick two fingers up to you and rebud straight away. It'll be instant because if a plant thinks it's going to die it will automatically try and reproduce itself. And to do that, it's got a flower, okay? So again, just take the tips out, and on the napita, just the very tips, okay? So that's the basket built, in a nutshell. Right, we'll put a little bit of feed on the top, if I can find it. Okay, let's fast forward seven days. He's one I may do. Oh, although the geranium's a bit flat because I've fleece on it. That's the same basket in seven days in a greenhouse. Okay, still early. Okay. So, nothing to it. And that's early May. So imagine June, July, August, September. You've got a long way to go yet. So that is the most crucial thing you can do is to give them a trim. Uh, remove all the flour off it and just get that basket to bulk out. If you want to trim the moss, you can. Uh, a lot of the ladies will be probably screaming at me to trim the moss. It'll be bugging them, but we don't generally do it because we haven't got the time. But And you won't see it. If you build a de decent basket, you will not see the moss in the next two weeks. Okay, any questions? Um, um, if it's um, if it's very wet, probably you'd be better off mixing it with a new bag of compost. If it's only last season, as it won't be a, a massive problem. Um, is it just a normal multi-purpose compost? Yeah. I mean, they don't tend to put slow-release feeds in the retail compost anyway, so you won't be 
in trouble like I was. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't know the answer to that. We do get a bit of trouble in the greenhouses, uh, especially with wagtails um, and little Jenny wrens as well. So the Jenny wrens will 